It's almost time. I thought that was the sun coming in. It's not. Some of it is, yeah. So, so the box is over here, right? Okay. So I'm not going to walk over here or I'll be in the way. Oh, that's it. Okay, I see. Good. I was going to say, don't leave it like that. I'll be, if I'm on the screen up there, I'll never get... We'll never get anything done. He put the camera from me up on those, and I could just see myself. Rude. <laughs> I am the last person that I want to watch teach. Um, looks like it's time to start, and so we'll go ahead and get underway, and um, we'll start as always, as we always do, uh, if you've got your prayer sheet, uh, if not, they're right outside the door. Um, and we have some changes on here. Uh, not a lot of changes, but a couple. Uh, I'll, I'll draw your attention. Uh, hospice care, of course, Pat is uh, continuing on. The last, the last report I had on Pat was that his appetite was not strong he his, felt like he was losing his appetite didn't want to eat much um he's a toothpick compared to me but a lot of people are uh so he's not a real nobody's going to accuse pat of being heavy set so for him to not have an appetite uh could be cause for concern but uh that was the last report i had uh from herb stevens that had talked to Pat Fournier. So uh, Steve Berner is on here under our general requests. Um, he's just, he's having, what did they say in the email? I read the email, I got the email and read it. And as you do, you get the email, you read it and you pray. And I left it there and I didn't print it and didn't bring it with me. Um, but they're, they're, trying to figure some things out right we the the older i get and the longer i live which those two things go together um i have friends who are physicians and so when i tell them so you practice medicine and when you say that you you mean it like we mean it right that you're trying to get better at it and most of my friends say and now my surgeon friends i hope that they already know and that they're better at that but the ones that are general practice, yeah, we're just trying to, you know, there's new things all the time. Um, so Steve Berner is on here. Be praying for him. Uh, Herb Stevens is still on here. Uh, he, I, I, I went back and forth with him over a chat last weekend and uh, said that we'd been praying for him, and he greatly appreciates that because he said it's never a bad thing for people to be praying for you. Uh, so he continues to... Uh, He's improving, but you know how it is. Uh, nobody improves as quickly as they want to, right? And it's always slower than you want and all of these things. Uh, Tom and Vera Cox continue to be on here. If you were here Sunday morning, uh, they were sitting, sitting in the back, and we recognized them and their, their wedding anniversary and all that stuff. Uh, we didn't stream last week, but I'll go ahead and mention... Uh, had and Thelma Clayton's we, we we recognized them in here well not in here but in our group last week and uh theirs was it was their 70th I believe and so uh Thelma's not able to get out as much uh, but Had's able to get out here and there and uh, I had a uh, uh a wedding photo from them from 70 years ago in the old sanctuary and all of that over there that's that, that, that we're all that we were in and we loved it so much and here now we're in this gigantic room with all the room for everything you could possibly need to do in here um i've got melissa weaver here continuing on uh there at st john's sterling killian that's ray purdom's friend with heart surgery recovery that's always 
I, I hesitate to, to skim over some of these because these are, I, I don't want to say, well, it's just heart surgery. The word just in front of any kind of surgery um, or minor procedure Nothing is minor when it's happening to me, and so I don't want it to be minor when it's happening to other folks. Uh, but that's Ray Purdom's friend, uh, Sterling there. Uh, Beverly Bates, last Wednesday, we prayed for her. Uh, she had surgery on a broken hip. She is being moved from uh, Tulsa to Bartlesville uh, for the rehab, to rehab that. Uh, that's, of course, Jerry Bates' sister. And uh, it's one of those things... Right? You get a tall truck or SUV, and those things are super easy to climb in and out of when you're in your 20s and 30s, and after that, they are less easy, and one little slip, and you can fall. So, um, but she is, uh, she came through the surgery well from all reports that I had, but the, I, I'm glad to see that they're moving her back to Bartlesville for rehab so that you don't have to, you know, there's less going back and forth. Uh, those of us who've made that trip back and forth to Tulsa daily, whew, um, it's one thing if you're working there and they pay you to do it. It's another thing when you're going back and forth to the hospital daily and things like that. Um, under our cancer treatment list here, uh, we've got Lonnie Landers, uh, Debbie Bonham, of course, um, Sue Ann, Joel Hahn, uh, and Mary Hill, Joe Lewis's daughter. Um, you may notice uh, uh, that no one named Byfield is on there anymore. So um, that's a good that's a good thing. I, I again I don't have as many uh, updates this week, and for the simple reason Becky's out of the office. And I know it sounds like an excuse. Becky's not been in the office. Patty's been in there filling in. She's done a fantastic job. But Becky is Becky, right? Every place you've ever worked, there's always somebody that you just can't do without. And we can do without Becky, but we really would rather not. It's like at the end of last year when we didn't have Tina for a few weeks or a couple of months. And it took, oh my goodness. And uh, we have... I don't think sometimes that our church family uh, can fully appreciate um, the staff that we have here during the week and how just how good they are um, and how blessed we are with the people that we have. Um, and I don't just mean uh, the ministers in the building such as we are. Um, our support staff uh, is top-notch and second to none. I would put them up against anybody. Uh, now, I'm a little biased uh, due to my family connections uh, to some of our former support staff in the building. Um, it has been one of the great joys of the last few years off and on uh, to work with some ladies that my mother trained because it's like working with her. And so... Um, Again, our ladies here, our, our, our support staff here, across the board, um, second to none. But Becky's been out, so I feel like I'm up here with at least one arm tied behind my back, figuratively. So um, I will point out, we do have uh, a verse at the bottom. Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Hebrews 11.6. Anytime we get scripture down there, and this, this is exciting, the reason we're able to put scripture down there is not because we don't want it there other times, but it's because there were no deaths within our family. We always, we always down there at the bottom, that's where we announce those, that's where we express our, our sympathy and we bring up... Uh, so that we can be praying for families of those who have lost people. But we don't have anybody this week. It's a blessing. And so we put the scripture in there. Now on the back, our ministry focus for the week, there's a couple of them. Uh, this Sunday, Anna's Heart is having a lunch. 
and um, there is a new name coming for that. They're changing the name, uh, changing uh, the focus a little bit. It has been for strictly for widows. It is now being expanded, as you see here, a ministry for single senior ladies of BFBC. All right? Um, so if you're a single senior lady, go get just some lunch. Right? Now, the Sunday is St. Patrick's Day, but we're Baptists, so it, I don't know that it's going to matter that much. I don't think they're serving green eggs and ham or anything like that. But uh, that is uh, something to be aware of. Uh, also, that's 12 to 2. So as soon as we're done uh, with our worship time, you can head over to the activities building and it will be in uh, all ready for you. The other thing I want to point out here is our Hope Clinic hygiene donations. We do this every so often. We have big buckets, like big buckets, and I've been thinking about it, I would have brought one up here. Big giant buckets, they're strategically placed around the building here, and you can drop off uh, these, uh, these items here mentioned. Uh, there's hand soap, you know, deodorant for women, uh, all the way down to shampoo. All right, different items. And if you can't read that, there'll be slides up here on Sunday morning. And it's on the app if you want to see that. Or if you are like the ladies in one of the... There were ladies in a church I served once that in all of their Bibles they had... Have you seen these uh, magnifying things? It's a sheet. It's a sheet. And they would have this so they could read their Bibles because the, the print was small. And it was like a magnifying glass, but it, it goes in your Bible. And you can, I may need to get something like that for preaching. Um, not yet, but soon. Maybe, we'll see. Uh, so those items, and this is coming on the heels of our hygiene kits that we brought together and made to send uh, to Honduras. Uh, in the spring or in that summer uh, this is for Hope Clinic here in town um, we believe that we can make an impact here at home as well as abroad and this is an easy thing we can do um, Joanna my daughter made I think two or three kits to send just had a ball putting the things together, and now the buckets are out. So she's ready to go hit the stores again and bring in some shampoo and deodorant and soap and all that good stuff um, because everybody uses that stuff. Everybody needs that stuff. And so it's here. It will be available. Uh, those buckets are there to help out folks at the Hope Clinic, um, which is something that our association here... Um, wonderful ministry to the community so those are our ministry focus uh points and then on of course on the other side those names that we went through and mentioned uh would you join me as we pray for these tonight our father we love you we thank you for bringing us here we thank you for watching over us lord we thank you that for those that are mentioned here on this list uh, lord those who have moved off the list uh, Lord, those that aren't on the list yet, we thank you that you are already moving in those situations. Lord, you know needs long before we do, and we trust that you are the great physician, that your spirit is our comforter, and the one who comes alongside us. Um, Lord, we pray for comfort. We pray for recovery. Uh, Lord, we pray for healing for our brothers and sisters here within our body and those who are connected to our body by friendship, uh, Lord, by family, by blood. And um, Lord, we trust you that all of these things are in your hands. We lay them there and we leave them there. Uh, Lord, knowing that we will continue to bring these concerns before you because you've told us to do just that. Uh, Lord, now as we turn our attention uh, to your word and what is found there, 
Lord, I pray this would be a profitable time. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would use this time to draw us closer to Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Real quick, I want to remind you, we're not going to meet next week. It's spring break. I know you're all planning on going to the beach for your spring break. I don't see anybody shaking their head. Yes. Um, Good. The beach is awful. It's just going to be crowded anyway. Uh, But next week is spring break, so uh, there'll be no activities unless you are in the choir. And let's let's just be honest. If you were in the choir, you'd be in the choir right now. Uh, So uh, we'll not meet next week, which makes it kind of unfortunate that we're starting this tonight with part one, and then we'll take a week off, and by the time we get to part two, I hope you remember. I hope I remember. Um, But I wanted to be sure and and bring that up at the beginning. Uh, Something else I want to bring up, I'm not going to walk over there because I remember that's where it is. Um, Last week, again, we didn't, we weren't able to stream because we were in a different room. But last week we talked a little bit about um, how it's become a major issue in many churches as well as outside the church that we love the Bible, we revere the Bible, but nobody reads it. And they don't know what's in there. And if you just, if someone were to come up to you in, in the line at Walmart and ask you what was in a particular book in the Bible, many of us couldn't tell them, right? Because we all have certain passages that we like to go to. We have certain books that we enjoy and that we come back to again and again and again. We live in the Gospels, right? Uh, Those who are in D groups just finished up a month in Leviticus. When's the last time you did that? Which that kind of colored some of our discussion on the Q&A that we had a couple of weeks ago um, some questions coming out of Leviticus and uh, fortunately I knew we'd been in Leviticus so I, I wasn't really prepared uh, so, so the idea here is that rather than go um, verse by verse through the entire Bible which would take decades right let's be honest Especially, some of you are going, yeah, especially the way you teach. It would take a very, very long time. Um, The idea here is kind of a bird's eye view of each, particularly in the Old Testament. Uh, This may take us, I don't, I don't know. It may, it may take most of the, most on, on into the summer. Um, But the plan is we'll go through section by section We'll start off with the books of Moses, the first five, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, Some books take longer to give a bird's eye view than others. Genesis, obviously, being so foundational, so important, such a a big deal, um, I'm going to give it two weeks. Could probably go three, could probably go four. But I'm restricting myself to two weeks. We're going to, we're going to, we're jogging here. And some of you are thinking, jogging? Oh, uh, I, think, I think my wife, I think Kara suggested breezing through the Bible. Maybe it was galloping. I don't, I don't remember. Galloping through Galatians, Genesis. I don't know. But so all I had for now was what's in the Bible. I, that seems like a really boring title to me. That doesn't sound like a study that a lot of people are going to want to come to, right? Because they would say, well, every Bible study is called that or is about that, right? Every Bible study should be about what's in the Bible. Uh, so that, that may change. But uh, tonight, part one, and uh, that's Genesis chapter one through chapter 11. Now, I don't know what your Sunday school class has been going through in, in, on Sunday mornings, but my class on Sunday mornings, uh, we've been going through Genesis, and we, uh, we just got to Isaac, so we are further ahead in my Sunday school class than we are ever going to get to tonight. But rest assured, since we're not meeting next week, in two weeks, we'll get through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Which is moving pretty quickly, but it'll be okay. Uh, and also, I don't have a clicker, so there we go. Um, 
So Genesis means beginning. And this is the book of the beginnings. Um, and we have a uh, foundation for everything. The reason the world is the way it is, you find that in Genesis. What, are we gonna, what is God going to do to fix it? You find that in Genesis. Where did it all come from? That's in Genesis. Okay? And so it's all there, which I suspect is the reason why this particular book comes under the level of attack that it comes under. People will come at it, and, and uh, it's especially these first 11 chapters. And so the book starts with a broad thing. You know, this is how the world starts, and then it gets a little more specific into the Hebrew people. There are two beginnings here because it is the book of beginnings. Now, is that, can you actually see it? I'm, I, I wasn't sure. I've never used this kind of cool stuff before. And, uh, but I thought if I, made, if I made handouts for you, they'd be as thick as your Bible. And so I didn't want to do that. If you, if you would like them later, let me know, and I can get them to you. Um, and so the first 11 chapters, that's where we are tonight. The beginning of the world all the way down to uh, the tower, right? The creation in six days, Adam, Eve, the garden, Fall of man, that's the part we really don't like. Cain and Abel and their little brother Seth. Uh, Noah, the ark, the flood, all that stuff. Uh, and the tower and God moving the people out and scattering them. And then, of course, the very next chapter, we have the call of Abraham. And we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And at the, by the end of the book, we have Joseph. And he's in Egypt and then we have all of, they're not really, the, they're literally the children of Israel at that, part, at that point because they're the sons of Jacob, the sons and daughters of Jacob who was called Israel. And so the children of Israel, just the family, are there at the end of Genesis. And then a whole bunch of time passes and we get to Exodus. But that's a ways off. We're not there yet. And so to start, we've got creation, creation in six days. Now, since it's not Q&A tonight, I'm not going to tell you about how some people see this as symbolic and some people see it as... The text says it's, it says six days. And then on the seventh day, he rested. Um, people write books and books and books upon this. Um, but the word is day. So first day, light. Second day, the sky and the firmament. The firmament is... Uh, it's different than we have, right? Because remember, before the flood, they had never seen rain. This is why when he says, you know, when they come up to Noah while he's building the thing for years and years and years, what's this about? Well, God's going to send, you know, rain and stuff on. There's going to be water and it's going to flood. Never seen that before. The water uh, that, that waters the, the plants is dew that comes up from the ground. And the firmament is the sky and the clouds and all of that. Um, day three, dry land and plants. Um, then the sun, moon, and stars. And then the water-dwelling creatures on day five and birds, fish and birds. And then day six, all the land-dwelling creatures, the ones that taste good and the ones that don't, and then man, people. Okay? And... Uh, we came last, and we came with a special blessing and a special uh, mission and a commission. Uh, God gave us instructions that he did not give to birds and dogs and wolves and chickens and stuff, okay? Um, and then, of course, on the seventh day, God rested, not because he was tired. Be aware of that. My students are always like, why, why did God rest? Not because he's tired. If your God gets tired, you probably need a new God. Now, Jesus got tired, but Jesus in his humanity got tired, right? His, his divine nature doesn't get tired. The Holy Spirit doesn't get tired. Uh, and so uh, at the end of each day, God declares what he's done to be good. 
and the entire world is called either good or very good seven times. Seven is a big deal in the Bible. It's a number of completion, number of perfection. Um, and I will also point out to you that uh, after the fall, it didn't cease to be good. The world we live in is corrupted by sin. We know this. We contribute to this. But that doesn't mean it's not good, right? If it weren't good, whew, we'd be in real trouble, right? We're already like, well, it's kind of, things are kind of out of hand, but it's still the, the world that God made. It's corrupted, it's not as it should be, but it's still good. And so God rests, again, not because he's tired, but to set in place a weekly pattern of rest for the crown jewel of his creation, men and women. We must rest. Um, God did not create us to work constantly. God did not create us to be busy all the time. The pattern is there. Six days shall you labor, and the seventh is the Lord's, and you will rest. It's good stuff. Um, so man and woman, here it is. Man is created, it says, in the imago dei. That's a big Latin phrase that theologians use for in the image of God. Out of the dust of the ground. The Christian faith holds, teaches, believes, because we received it from God, that people are special and people have dignity and worth because we are created in the image of God. We are not accidents. We are not grown-up germs. We are not amoebas with 401ks. Okay? We are a, a specific creation of God, created in the image of God to reflect the character and the, the uh, actions of God. Woman created out of uh, man's rib. She is the only suitable companion for the man. We'll say that louder for the people in the back, right? Maybe even for the people out walking down the street. The only suitable companion for the man is the woman. If you've been married more than 15 minutes, you've probably seen some of that. Um, there are so, I, I could, we all probably, all, all of us, uh, all of us married folks, uh, Kara and I are coming up on 25 years, um, which when I was a kid, I thought, wow, that's, that's a long time. But what that means is that our birthdays are even further up than that. Uh, but I can tell you story after story after story that there are things that I need help with and there she is and there are things that she needs help with and here I am and she probably still needs help once I get here but that but the point is the suitable companion for the man is the woman and uh, humanity right there and Adam and Eve given two whole commandments right two commands and a warning as my daughter would say you had one job <laughs> be fruitful and multiply there are many in the culture today who even if they're happy being married they don't want kids so you get married for the tax benefit but not to have children um says be fruitful and multiply fill and subdue the earth uh, there are those who say well there are so many people now we've got billions with a b and there's it's just so crowded to which the response is it's not too crowded you just live in a big city if you went somewhere else you get outside of the big cities it's not as crowded as you may think uh, you go wander around osage county 
you can wander around and not run into a whole lot of people. Still, in the 21st century, there are places that you could go uh, in the States and even overseas. And then the last one here, those are the two commands. The last thing here, eat of anything in the garden you want, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that. Unless we think, well, I wouldn't have. That has never been my view. I've always thought, well, I probably would have, you know, the serpent would have said, hey, Kevin, you want one of these? Sure. It's just how I am. Uh, And so we have the fall of man. Eve is deceived by the serpent. Eve is not tempted. She is deceived first. Has that been your experience? The devil has to lie to you first. Has to convince you that something is true or might be true that isn't quite true, that you don't quite think about till later. Once you're deceived, you become easier to tempt. So do I. So Eve is deceived. She eats the fruit, gives it to Adam who was with her. Again, gentlemen, if a serpent real or metaphorical, is talking to a lady in your life, get between them. Adam eats the fruit too, and the scripture says their eyes were opened. They now have the knowledge of good and evil, not because God didn't want them to have that, but because they didn't need that. And now here it is. And their eyes were opened, our eyes are open, we know good and bad, We know sin and righteousness, and we're inclined toward one and not toward the other by nature. And so then there are, of course, consequences, right? Because if you recall the story, God comes to Adam. What have you done? It was the woman you gave me. God comes to the woman. The serpent deceived me. Now, there's plenty of blame to go around here, but the serpent gets to... uh, crawl around and eat the dust and there will be enmity between him and the seed of the woman Um, I saw this enmity many times growing up the enmity between the seed of the serpent and my grandmother was very strong Uh, my grandma did not like snakes like it was in her DNA um my mother was the same way. It came passed down that way. My sister doesn't like them either. Uh, now, is that, that's not to say that there can't be ladies that think snakes are just fine and that they want them for pets. That, if you want to do that, that's your business. But um, not at my house. Uh, the woman will also have pain in childbirth and be ruled over by her husband. Uh, every woman who's ever given birth has thought about that one. Uh, and the man shall labor and suffer to produce food. They had to work before. Don't don't get the idea that there was no work before the fall, and that for some reason that working for things and doing things uh, and working to get things is a result of the fall. No, no, no. They had to tend the garden. But now the ground is cursed, and now there are thorns, and now there are weeds. Uh, and, and my wife will fight those all summer long in the garden. She's planted the seeds. They're already starting to pop up. Not outside, because Kara is brilliant. She's got this thing set up, and she's got these little pods, and she's got all the things in there, and they're starting. And Joanna comes in and checks them frequently, four or five times a day, just to make sure that they're still not quite popping up out of the dirt, because we just put them in there. But but it's, it's, it's difficult. The earth is cursed with thorns and thistles. and That's why roses are unpleasant sometimes. My grandmother had a beautiful rose bush, but boy, it had thorns on it. Uh, reaching in there. Oof. I don't know if you can see that picture, but uh, I like that one. So what happens then? The ground is cursed. Curses on the serpent, on the man, on the woman. Everything's broken now. Now what? God slays animals to make coverings for Adam and Eve. 
because the fig leaves that they tried to use to cover everything up won't do it. Uh, This is God showing from the very beginning that the only payment for sin is death. Um, And not plant death. Right? Uh, But he makes these coverings for them. They are driven out of paradise. And there is an angel there with a flaming sword guarding the entrance. That is probably one of the most tragic parts in all of Scripture. And then the very next chapter, business picks up. Adam and Eve have a child. The, first, uh, is, the firstborn is named Cain. Abel is, of course, the secondborn. Cain is called a tiller of land. He's a farmer. Abel is a shepherd, a herdsman. And so they go and they bring offerings to God. And uh, this is one of those places where Genesis doesn't give us everything we need to know. Hebrews in the New Testament kind of comes in and fills in the story a little bit. But uh, they both bring offerings to God. Cain brings his vegetables. Abel brings from his flock. Now remember, we just saw sin requires death. And God is pleased and prefers Abel's sacrifice. Cain, imagine this today, being jealous of somebody else in church and following him out to the parking lot. Cain is angry, kills his brother, is judged by God. Because you see, uh, remember the promise to Eve was that from her seed would come one who would bruise his heel but would crush the head of the serpent. The first prediction of the Messiah is going to come from Eve. And now Cain is killing one who came from Eve. This is a big deal. He is judged, and Eve and Adam have another son named Seth, and it's through Seth now that the line to the Messiah will come. Now, if you've ever done one of those things in January where you're going to read the whole Bible in one year, you ever done that? And you get there, and you get a little bit past this, and you get into the begats. And so and so was the father of this person, and that, and it goes on sometimes for pages. And you may think, well, why is that? What's, what's that about? I mean, yeah, that's wonderful. It's showing God's faithfulness through the generations. Those all lead to Jesus. Abel is gone, Cain is out of the way. Jesus comes through Seth. So then time passes. A lot of time passes. And again, if you were in my Sunday school class, this is review. So, um, those folks. (laughs) Uh, And after nine generations, now these generations, these are people that live a long time. Some of these folks are living six, seven, eight hundred years. I had someone ask me recently, do you think it, why, why was that the case? Why is it that they live so long? Were their years different? Were there, you know, was, it, you know, was it a different way of reckoning things? Um, I don't think that's it. And again, this is just me talking, but, but uh, and from my study, um, the more into us sin gets and corrupts the whole lot of humanity, lifestyle and the life choices and everything else shorten things up. All right, Methuselah lives to be 969 years old. It's a long time. But I'll also remind you that Abraham lives to be in the neighborhood of 140 plus. So when the scripture says Abraham lived to be 140 years old and he was very rich, 
Well, yeah, he had time, right? If you can't get wealthy in 140 years, I mean, come on. Uh, so nine generations pass to get us to Noah. Mankind grows increasingly wicked. It gets worse and worse and worse. Not as bad as we have seen, though. Or, or worse than we have seen. I said that backwards. I know a lot of us look around, we're like, oh, look at all this wickedness out in the world. Look at all of this around us. Um, our culture has a whole lot more in common with the early church and the level of wickedness they dealt with in places like Rome and Galatia and Corinth and places like that than it does even with the days of Noah. However, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when the Son of Man comes. And so Noah is here. He is a righteous man in the midst of an incredibly wicked generation. And we're told he fears the Lord, which makes him strange, weird, not only that, but he leads his family to do it. Can you imagine indoctrinating his children into his religion? Can you believe it? I did it too. And so there they are. There's, there's three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. They also have wives. We don't know their names. Noah has a wife. And contrary to the statistic or the, the survey finding from last week, that I brought up. Her name was not Joan of Arc. It's a large percentage of Americans who answered the survey that the Gallup poll put out in 2016. I suspect the percentage would be higher today that would think it was Joan of Arc. I want that to have been a joke, but it wasn't. Um, and so God decrees judgment on mankind because there is only so far he will let us go, right? Um, we have been that way with our own children, right? There, there comes a point where you say, ah, that's enough. That's enough, right? I said, clean your room. I said, pick up your socks, right? If it's that way with us, how much more so with God? That's enough. And so judgment is coming and Noah is told to build an ark. He's told how to build it. Of course God knows how to build an ark. He spoke the world into being. Now, this is an artist's rendering because, believe it or not, I was not there. This is not a picture from my phone. Uh, but it did fit in nicely with the background, so I like that. So the ark is a big box because that's what ark means. Later they will have the ark of the covenant it's a big box. It has the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, and some other things in it. They carry it. It stays in the Holy of Holies. But this ark, Noah's ark, Noah, his wife, and his sons with their wives go in, and they take in two of every kind of animal, and they take in seven of every kind of clean animal. Now, what do I mean by clean animals? Well, they're the kind that you would sacrifice that would be acceptable. Now, this is before Moses has received all of that information. But it does tell us that in, the, in these before-the-flood antediluvian people that they knew some things. Some things had been passed down from Adam. Because remember, if your dad is 800 years old and your granddad is 860, and he shows no signs of stopping, the stories would have been handed down. Noah would not have been that far from Adam. There's not a long distance there between Noah being born and Adam dying. It's, it's pretty close. And so these stories would have been handed down. This information would have been given to them. God told us we do these things. God told us not to eat these things because it's not good for us and to eat these things because it is. These are clean. These are common and so here comes the flood. Now, this is very different than I remember teaching it when I was teaching the two-year-old class on Sunday mornings. We teach the Noah story a bit different in the preschool and in the nursery 
than I would teach it probably here tonight. Uh, the rain does come down for 40 days and 40 nights. Yes, that's where we usually leave it. Rain falls for 40 days and 40 nights. But the floodwaters go on for another 150 days. That's a long time to be in a big wooden box with a bunch of stinky animals, right? So barn floating on the water with people who've never seen rain before. So that's up to 190 days. Three more months, and the floodwaters are finally all the way gone. So that's what? A year or so? It's a long time to be in that box. And so they finally come out, and now we're moving on. More time passes because in Genesis, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This is part of our problem sometimes with the Old Testament is that there's so much time that passes. Right? As I mentioned last week, the lifetime of Abraham is longer than the entire New Testament. It's a little harder to wrap your brain around. Thousands and thousands of years. I have trouble with 120 years, 140 years. I'm currently having a little bit of trouble wrapping it around 50, honestly, some days. And so more time passes. Remember, mankind was told, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. After the flood, they get out. They're fruitful, they're multiplying, and they go, yeah, we'd like to stay together I already know these people you know I don't know what's out there we know this area and so they move out onto this plain they're all there together and they work to build a tower to the heavens and they say to each other uh, let's make our name great now in the Bible the only one whose name is great is God and the only ones who try to make their name great are God and the devil and these people. Sinfully, well, let's make our name great. Here's what we'll do. We'll build this giant tower that reaches to the sky. Right? And it'll be a monument to mankind's greatness. Can you imagine it's like the Titanic all over again. Or those big giant buildings, right? So the one in Dubai, you seen this one? It's massive, just up and up and up and up and up. Uh, beautiful building. So they build this big tall tower to reach to the heavens, to reach to the sky, to reach up where God is, to make our name as great as his bad plan so God sees what they're doing sees that they are continuing to defy him he said right multiply gotcha be fruitful gotcha fill the earth uh -uh. we all like being right here together we're going to do a, we're going to get together we're going to do this thing and so he as he often has to do with us when we refuse to obey, he brings in other means of persuasion. Right? You won't do what you're told, so now you will. So he confuses their languages. Everybody who's ever failed a spelling test in school can appreciate what he did there. Anybody who's ever been in an airport and realized that Theirs is the only language not spoken there. can appreciate this. Um, I was even telling my students today that we had lived in New Orleans for a while. Gracie was born there. Sorry, Grace was born there. She'll always be Gracie. Um, and they, they, one of the girls said, my parents are thinking of moving us there this summer. How is it? I said, it's an awful place to move to in the summer. Move in January. 
so that you have time to acclimate. I said, it's very humid. I said, and there are places in southeast Louisiana where you, you could go days without hearing English. She thought that was the neatest thing. She's about 14. Oh, that would be so wonderful. Uh, she said, well, would it be different than South Florida? I said, well, in that it would be a different language, yes. South Florida is going to be Cuban, and it's going to be Spanish. Southeast Louisiana is Creole and Cajun, and it's going to be, well, they call it French. Uh, confuse all the languages. Now, we don't cooperate well, do we? We're really good at not cooperating now. And now, instead of the whole of humanity coming together to make our name great, little pieces of us do. There's always some fella or lady somewhere that wants to make a name for themselves and wants to be very important and wants to be very famous and wants everybody to know who they are. But now we just get 15 minutes of fame. Some of these people stretch it out a lot longer than that. Some of them I wish they wouldn't, but that's, be that as it may. And so God disperses them, confuses their language, and we've spent all of the time since then trying to get back, haven't we? That's what the Internet's about. There it is, next time. Not next week. Everybody notice, it doesn't say next week. If you show up here next week, Wade will draft you and you'll have to go to choir. Now, for some of you, that might greatly improve the choir. If I'm here and he makes me go to the choir, he'll have to find a spot where the microphone won't get me. Uh, but next time we're together in two weeks, uh, rather than the beginning of everything, we'll focus in the beginning of the Hebrew people because that's what the Old Testament is really about. And how do we get from Abraham to Jesus, because that's what it's about. You start in Genesis, and you got, it's a long way to Matthew. 39 books, but you can make it. Um, and so that will be next time. Let's pray, and uh, we'll get out of here. It's early. Don't look at your watch. It's early. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to just kind of uh, skim along Lord, sometimes we take the time to be in the glass-bottom boat across the lake that is your word, and we stop and we look at every letter, every syllable, every verse, every chapter, and we spend hours on them, and those things are good. Lord, I pray that as we do things like we did tonight, where we don't have the glass-bottom boat, but we are going across, skimming across the top, on a speedboat, Lord, that you would help us to appreciate the big picture. Lord, to, to help us to be mindful of the, the big things as much as the small things. Lord, there are so many things within the Scripture that we, we maybe are, are overly familiar with that we think, oh, everybody knows that. Lord, I pray that even as we encounter these things that everybody knows... Lord, show us more. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.